Hello and welcome to the second episode of ISO 400. I am your host, Julius Motel. For those of you who watched our first episode last week with Nico Gooden, thank you. And for those who are just tuning in for the first time, ISO 400 is a podcast by The Photographer where I serve as the managing editor. It's a video interview series in which I talk to photographers from all over the world about their art, craft, and story. In this episode, I'll be talking to Mike Lerner, who was a professional poker player before he became a concert photographer. In 2007, he photographed Katy Perry before she really became Katy Perry. And after some time and working more, he eventually landed a gig as Justin Bieber's tour photographer, which took him all over the world. If you've seen a photograph of Justin Bieber, there's a good chance it was taken by Mike Lerner. So, he's since left concert photography to focus more on commercial and lifestyle work. In this episode, we'll find out why he left and what he's doing now. And you can find out more about his work and see examples of his photographs on the post about this episode on our website. And as always, our music is provided by Yuki Futami, a New York-based jazz musician. Thanks so much and hope you enjoy. Hold on, let me um, close my door real quick. Sure. Also, the logic board of my laptop is kind of messed up, so if we get cut off, okay, that's the reason. No worries, we'll reconnect, I'll splice it all together. Uh, yeah. So, thank you uh, for doing this. Welcome to the second episode of ISO 400. Uh, so... As far as I understand from all my research, you were a poker player before you became a photographer. In 07, you had the chance to photograph Katy Perry before she really became the Katy Perry we all know. Um, And eventually you landed the gig as Justin Bieber's tour photographer. Uh, But you've since left concert photography, and you're focusing more on lifestyle and commercial work. Um, And we'll get to that switch a bit later. Um, If you don't mind, if we could go back to the beginning... Uh, yeah. you, you had said in previous interviews you were in a club, you had seen what the photographer was doing, and then you eventually saw his concert work and realized you wanted to do that. And yeah. so you picked up a Canon 50D, and then a no, month... A Nikon D50. A Nikon D50, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. you essentially uh, started going out and shooting stuff, and then eventually, you sh- a month later, you were shooting a Terminal 5. Um, yeah. So if you could take me through that first month learning the camera, like when did you realize that you could really do this? Um, well, let, okay, so like you said, you know, being in the club, seeing the photographer was one thing, and then going to his website after finding his card somewhere yeah. was another thing. Um, the only pho- photography training that I had was um, being able to take photos on a regular SLR 35 millimeter camera. Mm-hmm. Um, so I knew how to load film, I knew how to meter light because my camera's light meter was broken. Um, so I was able to do a lot of that stuff on the fly. My dad's a, you know, a hobby photographer. Uh, um, but it wasn't even, I wasn't even learning how to use the camera. I think the first ever time I used it was to take it to Terminal 5 mm-hmm. um, to shoot that first band which was the Bravery. and. I didn't know what I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I I had the booklet with me, and I was looking up settings and stuff, and it was just really telling me what the different settings were. Right. Um, so I asked one photographer. I said, "Hey, what ISO are you shooting at?" And he kind of shrugged me off. And there was a guy next to me. Um, I think Rocco Rocco Valone, who's a photographer now, is still we talk sometimes. And uh, or no, his name is Roger Kersby. That's his name. Mm-hmm. His nickname is Rocco. Um, I had asked him, and he'd given me a couple of pointers, and from then on, the photos were shit that day. But um, since then, we we had seen each other at shows at Terminal Five, mm-hmm. um, so we've kept in contact since then. So, but yeah, it was it was really bad. A lot of the photos came out um, because obviously, when you're shooting at higher ISOs, you have to shoot at um, slower shutter speeds mm-hmm. if you're if if you're not shooting wide open. So I was shooting at like f5.6, you know, f8 and stuff like that just because I wanted the photos to be somewhat sharp. Mm. So I had very slow shutter speed, so I would get a lot of, you know, uh, in-camera effects and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, th- I, and I thought that was cool. I got the photos back and I was like, oh, this is cool. And, you know, that's, what, that's kind of what pushed me to do it more because I mm-hmm. thought the photos were cool. When looking back on it, I kind of get almost sick when I see them. But <laughs> Yeah, I can it, imagine. 
Um, yeah. So, once you landed uh, the gig as Beaver's tour photographer, how long were you on the road for? As far as I understand, it was a long time. Yeah, it was from off and on from March of 2011 to December of 2013. Well, that's a long time. <laughs> 11 was maybe collectively four months mm -hmm. just because I was on the back end of his first world tour. Mm -hmm. I got hired um, for the for the after the United States, so Europe, uh, Australia, Asia, because mm -hmm. they needed to find a new photographer. And then I did his Believe tour, which was U.S. twice, uh, right. the world, Africa, and everywhere else. So, right. yeah. so for about three years, I've been working with him. That's a long well, time. Yeah. How did you, so on the road for that long, I mean on and off, but how did you maintain a work-life balance um, while you were well, out there? Well, I mean, it was, it was rather simple because anytime he had a show, I was at work. Mm -hmm. You know, if we had off days, I wasn't working unless uh, his management or him wanted me to come along and take photos of something, whether it was like a charity event or mm -hmm. playing golf or something like that, where he knew I played golf, so he would take me along to play golf and I would take photos on the golf course. So I, it was very it was very easy, you know. I worked three hours a day, and then I had my off days. And when you know you're in South Africa and you have two off days, yeah. you know what do you do? You see animals, you go explore the country and stuff like that. So I, I had a very good work balance. It wasn't it wasn't frustrating at all. And a lot of people can put a lot of pressure on themselves mm -hmm. and just spend too much time trying to get everything right and trying mm -hmm. to be organized. And I'm not one of those people, so. <laughs> I, I I was able to have fun. Oh, that's good. That's good. Did you? I imagine when you're doing the same thing for a while, you can hit um, creative roadblocks. Yeah. Um, and has that happened for you? And how did you uh, get past that? How did you come out of those? Well, you gotta understand when you're on tour and you're touring with a big act like that, their set's gonna be anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half, maybe a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So. If the set had lasted any longer than that, three to four hours, let's say, I would have definitely probably hit a wall at some point mm -hmm. and say, what am I doing here for the 65th time? There's nothing new I can do. Right. But with the show being that short, there are little nuances you can catch and little subtleties that I, that I would catch and say, you know what, for this show, I'm not going to focus as much as on Bieber mm -hmm. because you know I shot him 80 times before that from every possible angle. Let me focus on maybe the dancers today. Let me focus on Stan. Let me focus on uh, the crew doing their jobs. So I, it's very easy to, you know, with, with the crew that big mm -hmm. and a show that big, it's very easy to come up with new and different ways to shoot things. So mm -hmm. um, no, I didn't hit any creative roadblocks. And, you know, some shows I would shoot uh, the whole show in black and white. Mm -hmm. Actually, I did that a lot maybe 35% to 40% of the shows that were shot in black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I was, able to, I was able to do a bunch of different things. I really didn't hit any creative roadblocks, I guess. You yeah. Say. yeah. Um, and in the, on the off months when you were home, how were you spending your time? Were you still, were you doing photo? What were you doing with photo? I mean, I was spending a lot of time with, I don't know if you could see her, she's like balled up over there. I can my, see her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Spent a lot of time with her. Uh, spent a lot of time with, you know, family or mm -hmm. you know relationship I was in. Um, but then I also had a couple photo jobs. Uh, Hollywood Records is a bigger client of mine, mm -hmm. and it's a long story of how they how they started working with me. Just uh, someone had mentioned my name because they thought I would fit for a certain job. Yeah. And then since then it's just you know they whenever they need someone in New York or if I'm in L.A. and they need somebody, but. Yeah, I I did um the first time I came off of his tour in twenty twelve I did something with Demi Lovato. Like I traveled with her for like two or three days. I can't really remember. But um mm -hmm. yeah, so I did I did like small music jobs like that. Because yeah. once I did do the Bieber thing, a lot of other musicians and labels wanted to do stuff with me. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. So yeah, not too busy. Oh good. Um what what changed? Because in, in the correspondence over email, you had said that you have since left Concert Photo. You're no longer uh, doing that. What, why'd you leave? Because it's, I'm just uninspired by it. Mm. I, I think, I'm, I, I don't want to say that I'm cynical, sure. but I'm kind of outspoken about a lot of things. And I, you know, I respect a lot of concert photographers. I do 
one of my roommates is probably one of the best concert photographers out there mm -hmm. right now, Matt Bogle. So if you know all your viewers are watching this, they should probably Google Matt Bogle. Okay. He's actually getting ready to go on tour today. With whom? Uh, he's going out with this band called Paris. Nice. Who's opening for it's it's like a like punk scene rock kind of bands that they're opening for, but they're a kind of a indie electronic rock band. Mm -hmm. Awesome band. Um, I don't know. I, I there are a lot of there are a lot of people doing it. Mm -hmm. I think every every young person wants to be or who's interested in photography at some point wants to shoot music, and I've just been very uninspired by it. I haven't. It all looks the same. Mm -hmm. Um, except for Matt, really, and um, I just wanted to do something different. I, the, actually, while I was off on the off months, when I was living in Brooklyn, I was doing a lot of model testing for agencies, mm -hmm. and I said to myself that I kind of like portraiture more. I kind of like the fashion aspect of, of photography a little bit, so from there, I've been kind of learning more about portraiture, learning more about fashion, learning more about studio work, even though I haven't been doing too much studio work, but mm -hmm. that's the kind of area I want to be involved. It's just music photography, it's 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 hard to make a living in it. It yeah, really is. Sure. What's the what's the key to making money? I mean I I've shot concert gigs but typically for friends and things. Um, right. I, I well, imagine it's very difficult to get a paid it gig. Is tough. It is tough because the you know, when you have 40 people in a photo pit for a music festival, mm -hmm. you know, that it's very hard to sell your photos if you're there for yourself or if you're there for just a blog or something like that. No one's going to pay you to be there, right. you know. Uh, a magazine like Rolling Stone will pay you $500 to go to two days of Made in America in Philadelphia to shoot huge acts like Jay-Z, Beyonce, Kanye West, but I mean, that's, you know, you're spending 16 hours of your time for $500 doesn't make any sense. The real way in music photography to make money is if you're touring mm -hmm. with a big act or even you know a a, a good sized club tour or something like that. Sure. Um, sure. Shooting promo, I guess. If you're shooting promo every day for bands or for artists, that's probably make a decent living. Mm -hmm. Or or shooting uh, like covers, album covers, or anything for the album is good, but. A lot of people, what they're doing now, and I've seen this trend, is that they're they're going on tour for free, mm -hmm. selling themselves just per diem, which is just money to eat every day that everybody in the crew gets, and they're negotiating the ownership of the photos so that they can sell them on their web stores. Hmm. This is in a certain area of the music world. It's the very uh, scene, sort of scene pop punk rock music or whatever it is. Um, you really don't see that anywhere else, mm -hmm. but yeah, I've I've noticed that's the way some people make money. There's a there's a couple photographers out out there that I know that make a lot of money in it, but I don't know. The music photography is also weird for me because I see the photographers almost getting as big as the bands. Mm -hmm. Photographers kind of start creating merch for themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't. It, it it becomes less artistic for me, and that's more money driven. And don't, I mean, don't get me wrong; I want to make money. Of course, but I want to get money in the way that somebody wants to hire me to shoot a campaign or to shoot, uh, you know, uh, press photos or mm -hmm. shoot tutorials or something like that. That's that's they they want to use. They're hiring me. They're paying me for my art, right. and I get that. That's what music photographers are doing, but they're they're not being hired for their art, they're being hired so that they can sell their art, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know, if yeah. that makes any sense. No, it does, it does. I don't want to sound pretentious either, like, oh, I'm, I'm good, I'm too good to, you know, uh, work for free, and then, I, I, I'm not saying that at all, mm -hmm. it's just something I'm not, I'm not drawn yeah, into or do that. Was there, rather, yeah, was there, um, was there like a key moment when you realized I'm finished with this, or was it a steady build-up uh, with regards to leaving Concert Photo? Yeah, I mean, there were Hollywood Records contracted me a couple times to follow some of their artists mm -hmm. and do day in the lives of them, and just basically do documentary photographer uh, photography. Sorry, documentary photography, and I like that a lot more. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, it. The music of it is kind of, 
it, it's different when you're on tour with someone it's different but you sure. know if 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 uh you know a magazine says hey go to this show and shoot it or geez, i'm just i'm not drawn into that i want to kind of spend more time with the artist and document their lives more than just the just the performance mm -hmm. aspect of it. so that's kind of when they, i did about four or five jobs for them and i'm like this is kind of what i want to do mm -hmm. uh, you know and for me lately what i've been doing is i've been sh i've been shooting like mini stories mm -hmm. it's weird it's so the last thing I did for Hollywood Records was uh, I went out with this group R5. Mm -hmm. Day in New York, uh, they were doing. They wanted um, they wanted photos, black and white, gritty photos, and it was of a performance. But I spent the whole day with them, mm -hmm. and uh, it was for a small little like a tour book almost that they were going to sell. So they hired me specifically to shoot these photos for this tour book, and I noticed that all the um, all the guys in the band were wearing Converse sneakers. So I said to myself, let me turn this into a mock Converse campaign. Mm -hmm. So I had that in mind so that when I got the photos back later, I could pitch companies like Converse or Vans, I can pitch them kind of stories and say, hey, here's what I did, here's what this would look like, here's what a campaign, a uh, potential campaign would look like, just so that I can reach out to more people, sure. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that lately. So if a bunch of my friends have the same sort of clothes from the same company, I've kind of been doing like lifestyle stories around that. Mm -hmm. um, just because I've recently been talking to an agency and they think I have a good fit as a lifestyle editorial photographer. So mm -hmm. I've been kind of, you know, uh, centering myself in that um, headspace where, okay, let me see what looks good lifestyle-wise. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And what's your method when you approach these things? Do you go in with a preset list of shots? Do you storyboard at all? Or do you just go in with your camera, no plan, but see what the day brings? Well, it's half of that, and then it's half of um, going on Tumblr and looking up inspiration for the most part, mm. past campaigns or anything like that. Um, you know, a lot of these clothing companies will have the same look for the most part. It's very rare that they'll that they'll completely break from what they were doing and do something totally new. So you kind of get a feel for what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. So I kind of sit out and do that sort of thing. Um, if you look on my website, there's the Calvin Klein uh, collaboration that I did where I reached out to Calvin Klein via uh, this website called Four Card, which my buddy James started, where they put uh, brands and I guess they call them influencers. They don't want to call them bloggers anymore. I guess that word has kind of lost its uh, panache. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess bloggers are now called influencers. Mm -hmm. But um, it puts brands and influencers together. Like uh, there are certain brands that sign up to use the website, and I can reach out to Calvin Klein and I can reach out to Kenneth Cole and pitch them ideas. Mm -hmm. And either it'll turn into something paid or it'll turn into something um, collaborative where we'll send you clothes, go out and shoot whatever you want, and your models can keep the clothes and we'll promote your photos. Mm -hmm. so, that's, so that was something recent that I did where you know the whole Calvin Klein underwear thing has blown up in the past couple months out of nowhere, really. Yeah. And yeah, so um, yeah. nice. I don't it, the, so, the social media aspect of photography has also been driving me a little bit too. I just figured that if you're able to reach, if you shoot good content, if you have a decent sized following, brands will collaborate with you in order to push their photos via social media like Instagram and Facebook. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what has. I, what's tangent. that? So I, I kind of went off on a tangent there. Sorry. No, no, totally cool. Um, tangents are good. Um, yeah. But what do you find that these these types of photography that you're doing now? What do they give you? Like, what do they give you that concert photo no longer could? It's just new. I don't know. It's just new ways to create. With concert photography, it's like okay, I got to take pictures of the band and make sure that the lights look okay. Mm -hmm. That's that's really it. I mean, the band does everything. You're right. just you just you're just there, honestly. Yeah. With with lifestyle commercial. Uh, editorial, documentary, whatever it is, you're kind of planning everything out. Mm -hmm. Especially with editorials or you know any sort of branding work that I got to do, I have to think of things, either storyboard them, find inspiration for them, find models, find find stylists, find hairdressers, everything, find locations, and it's all up to me really. The creative side is all on my side. It's all mm -hmm. my responsibility. So 
having that back has kind of inspired me to start doing this work because when I'm doing music, it's just you know I don't. I don't really have any creative control over that. For shows, they do have creative directors, or they do have people who design the show a certain way, and I'm just, it's almost going to a museum and photographing it. All the stuff is there. Mm. You know, you're just there to take pictures. And, you know, you, you've, you compose it nicely and stuff like that, but that's really, your creative limit is just how you're going to compose the shot. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So. As far as uh, with all this new lifestyle work um, and commercial work, when you go into a shoot, how much, how big of a kit are you bringing? Like, <laughs> my my kit has has uh, been downsized dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was on tour, I had I had a one D Mark IV, just kitted out L lenses, uh, primes and zooms, flashes and batteries and extra extra batteries and all this stuff, flashes. And for the past year, I've been working with a five D classic and a fifty millimeter lens. Wow, that's it. Uh, the downsizing came because when I came off tour after about a couple months and just not having any work come in, and thus uh, so I got off on tour in December and I didn't really get a big job until June. Mm -hmm. I was paying for an apartment that I was paying too much for, and I was like, dude, I can't. I got to do something. So I sold a lot of the gear. I sold about eighty-five percent of the gear and kept the fifty because I was like, I can't sell the fifty. I got to. I got to keep that. That's kind of yeah. Um, and it, well, the fifty is just probably the cheapest lens. So I figured I probably couldn't get much for it. But um, <laughs> I sold all the gear and was able to survive until June, which is which is amazing. Um, but yeah, I did an interview with B and H, right? And they gave me some gift cards. Oh, like, this is wonderful. <laughs> so I looked on, I looked on the B and H website and I saw I used five D and I said, wow, with with the gift cards, I think I only have to pay like an extra hundred bucks for this camera. So I got the I got the 5D Classic, and it's just, it's its interesting to me, because I think it has a max ISO of 1600. Wow. So, <laughs> oh, <yeah>. man. <laughs> yeah. So, creative-wise, I'm finding, like, I'm, I'm shooting more outdoors anyway, mm -hmm. and when I'm in my place right now, since I live with four other photographers, we, they all have lights and stuff like that, so when I do shoot indoors, I'm able to set up lights and not really worry about anything. Mm -hmm. But I do have some interesting photos on my, uh, on my Tumblr blog, my main one. Mm. Where it was outside at sunset, and even the sun was going down, and you know that relatively low ISO was still able to create some really cool photos. And also, the five D Classic has amazing gray and silver tones on the LCD. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of cool to look at. It really doesn't look like anything else on the other five Ds. It's yeah. kind of interesting. I don't really know how to explain it because I'm sure. not too big of a gearhead, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, the next purchase I'm looking to get the 60 because my roommate has it. It's amazing. You can shoot. You know, it's a it's it's a see in the dark camera. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. Do you shoot beyond like outside of all the paid gigs? Do you do you have passion projects that you're working on? Like what's yeah. what's photo outside of work photo for you? So there's just been this project that I've been working on for the past three years. I've been trying to fund it for the longest time just because the only uh, funding that I would need would just be to travel around the country. But I've been wanting to do a project where I drive around the country and mainly spend time in small towns and seek out World War II veterans just because there are very little of them left. There are about a million left in the country. And um, I wanted to do a photo story about that, not only the men, but also the landscape of where they live. And um, I, at one point, had a documentary that was greenlit to go about it, where a crew was going to follow me around and kind of document mm -hmm. the story, but it got pulled because the investors pulled out. Ah. Uh, I tried, I tried a Kickstarter and uh, what's the other one? An Indiegogo. I tried mm -hmm. that, but my core following, as far as photography, are only really focused on one thing. Okay. So it's it's very hard to kind of raise money for a photography project that doesn't involve a certain pop star, which kind of sucks. But yeah. Uh, yeah, the goals were never hit. Um, and then uh, I tried the the visual supply company has uh, that scholarship of a million dollars where yes. they're giving grants, basically. Uh, I tried that. I think I applied for that grant once a day for a month. <laughs> I got turned down. They were like, no, we're not interested. So I, I just pitched them recently another story um, about my dad's an architect. Mm -hmm. uh, 
on Long Island, New York, where I grew up. And he's designed everything from small additions to uh, mansions on Long Island, mm -hmm. uh, corporate spaces, restaurants, you know, smaller restaurants. So I said to myself, he's approaching 70, and I'm moving back to New York. So I said, you know, let me spend a month with him behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. There, there are no scenes. It's just him. <laughs> You know, going to meetings with him, going to building departments with him, going to you know zoning meetings with him for a month just mm -hmm. to capture all that, and then for another month I can go to a lot of the bigger homes that he's designed on the island mm -hmm. and do architectural photography. So I kind of want to do that project about my father and about his his work. Yeah. So I'm hoping to hear back about that because I'm moving back at uh, the beginning of March. So okay. If I if get the go ahead, I can start doing that as soon as I get back, and really not worry about having to wait for any jobs to come in or doing any emailing or uh, mm -hmm. old calling or whatever to try and find work. So that'll be fun. I hope I get it. And it, even if I even if I don't get it right away, I'll probably I can probably still do it anytime I want. Right. How did you get the idea for the um, for the World War II vet project? We were me and a friend, a friend and I. Uh, we're in a van, we were on tour, and we were going to uh, this um, festival called the Bamboozle in New Jersey, where mm -hmm. it's just a lot of rock bands playing for two days. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we were talking about Saving Private Ryan, because me and, me and him, my friend Bill, are both really big uh, World War II buffs. And, right. And I said, I, th I don't know if he brought it up or if I brought it up, but one of us brought up the idea. He's like, oh, it would be great to travel around the country and to shoot these veterans and to photograph them and put a book together. And either one of us probably agreed that that was a really good idea. So since then, that was in 20, 2010. Yeah. So since then, I've been trying to do it. Um, I haven't really given up, but you know, anytime I try to raise money or talk to potential investors, I kind of try to make the point that, listen, in two years, if this project isn't done, it's going to be very, very difficult sure. to find these guys. I mean, it's easy to go to a nursing home and find them, but mm. that's not what I was looking to do. You know, I was looking to travel, so sure, uh, kind of stay away from big cities and you know focus on small towns. But what is it about the small towns that pulls you more so? I mean, if you look at you know like Robert Frank's America, mm -hmm. it's you know he does go to he's in huge cities, but it's. It's that small town. I don't know what it is. If you've ever seen that, have you seen that Super Bowl commercial uh, about last year? The God Made a Farmer. I think so. Yeah, yeah. And they commissioned uh, was it four or five photographers to work uh, to shoot on farms for a couple of days, and mm -hmm. whatever images they submitted, they ran with the commercial. And those photos just kind of spoke volumes about the. I don't want to say the working class in the country, but the small town farmers. Mm -hmm kind of go unrecognized. So a lot of people, they don't, they don't really think about small town America, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? unless they live there. Yeah. And most of the country doesn't live there. They live in big cities. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, you know, these men sacrificed, and women, sacrificed their youth to, you know, fight in a war which everyone believed in. It wasn't like a Vietnam or, you know, an Iraq war where people were kind of torn about it. Yeah. Everyone, everyone agreed to this war and, you know, a lot of them didn't come back, and those that did, uh, basically, were able to get the country back on its feet again. And I, I thought it was really, really interesting. To I wanted to speak to them, and I did. Um, I did last year speak to one veteran. I that's who I filmed to kind of get the Kickstarter going again. And, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I spoke to him and these guys. These guys remember every single detail of what they did. It's amazing, mm -hmm. um, even though it was you know sixty, seventy years ago, and. Um, yeah, it's just it's just it's just good. It's yeah. good. Uh, it's good history. It's good storytelling, um, and it's just would it would be great for photos. Yeah, no, of course. The main thing, taking a taking a DSLR out there, taking maybe a medium format film camera out there. Mm -hmm. Basically, take any camera you want out there and just produce really really good images. So, hopefully, I still get a chance to do it. Yeah, of course. How do you um, how do you how do you find these guys? How do you like what's the what's the research process for finding this kind of thing? There really wasn't. There was just going to be you know drive through Montana, stop somewhere, and ask. Mm. Hey, do any of you guys know an older 
an older gentleman or someone who was involved in the war, and chances are in those small towns everybody knows everybody. So they'd be like, oh, Glenn, let's, hey, do you know where Glenn lives? Yeah, let's go to, go to Glenn's house and you yeah. know, knock on the door and see what, see what happens. Um, but the first thing, uh, the, the first veteran that I actually photographed and um, was able to um, do some video of, how did I contact him? Um, oh, because the, mo the movie Fury was about to come out. Mm -hmm. And I looked up the, I think it was the, was it the big red one? Or is it, it was either the 1st Infantry or the 3rd mm -hmm. Infantry or something like that, whatever the tank division was in. So I looked up that tank division and I found uh, a list of people. So then I made that list smaller by looking for people in the you know two hour radius of Philadelphia or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I found one guy, I called him up, I said, do you mind if I come over next week and talk to you? And he said, sure. So I went over there and I talked to him. So that, that was just so I can get somebody immediately. Sure. So the problem wouldn't involve calling anybody or going to a nursing home. It mm -hmm. just would have been driving around. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd been doing um, some video too, and I know some photographers who making the switch from photo to video can be a bit difficult. How did you take up video? How's that been for you? The video thing was always just a, um, it was in companion to photography. It never took a precedent uh, mm -hmm. to photography. So the video thing was just, hey, you know, my camera can do record that. video. Yeah. Some, yeah, I've never, I, I haven't done anything where it's like, hey, we need you to specifically do video for this. Mm -hmm. uh, because if that was the case, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, I'm just not confident enough in video or editing to um, kind of take that on. But um, just for these smaller things, I, I just looked up some stuff. Like if I'm shooting 24 frames per second, make sure that your shutter speed is double and stuff yeah. like so that. All that's kind of all I did. I don't know lighting. I don't know any of that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not video is not a big part of my life, and I kind of told myself if anyone wants you to do any video while you're doing photo, kind of turn that down and mm -hmm. just focus on photography. Yeah. So. so what's next on your plate? I don't know. Um, I'm looking to just do a lot of personal lifestyle stuff, personal editorials, and submit those to a couple magazines. And then um, I've been talking to this agency for a year, mm -hmm. a pretty big agency in New York. They rep a lot of great photographers. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of photographers that, um, that I didn't know that they repped, and when I looked them up and first emailed them, I was like, there, there'll be no way in hell that they'll even respond back to me. And they did. They liked the work. So for about a year, I've been talking to them. and. Um, uh, over the weekend, I was recently put up for a big job, so mm -hmm. kind of hoping that that happens. I'll know by uh, this coming week. So you know, whenever this thing goes up, I would have either gotten it or yeah. I, <laughs> I wouldn't have. So um, that's it. And just basically doing that and putting more books together. I'm gonna try and put more promo materials out so I can mail them out to art agencies and art buyers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, which is which is big, obviously, for editorial and lifestyle photographers. If you're if you're not doing anything, then there's nothing to promote, right? And no one's going to hear about you. Yeah. And that's just that looking at inspiration every day. I've yeah. been I've been amassing a sort of it's on, it's on the small side right now, but a photography book collection. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a bit of a hobby. Any particular and, favorites? Uh, Danny Clinch, who's a music photographer, it has been for the past. 20 years he's probably one of the best music photographers out there uh, he, he just did he does the backstage photos at the Grammys where he sets up he builds a set okay. and then the uh, the winners holding the Grammys and stuff like that but um I bought his last book clinch is like a bestseller there's been a lot of buzz about it and I got I actually went to go meet him to go get the book signed and it's a funny story how I got the Hollywood records I emailed his agent mm -hmm. Uh, three years ago in his agency and I was like hey you know I'm this music photographer I'm out with Beaver I'm looking for representation it would be great and then they emailed me back saying oh you know we're really not looking to expand our uh, our roster at, the, at this time I said yeah. okay so the the Demi Lovato job came and I was contacted by Disney who owns Hollywood Records and I said how did you find out about me and they said oh this person I said I don't know who that is let me, let me <laughs> it's my so I found her, and I said, oh, hey, thanks for putting me up for the Demi Lovato job. How do we know each other? 
she said, oh, you emailed me a couple years ago looking for representation, and one of my photographers couldn't get a job, and I remembered you, I remembered your work, and thought you'd be a perfect fit. And I was like, whoa. And that's, a lot of agencies do that, by the way. They, they may not have a lot of uh, certain photographers on, on their official roster, either they're mm. still talking to them, or, um, you know, they just don't really have space, but if some of their photographers either aren't the best fit or aren't able to do it, they'll contact these photographers. Yeah. So they're kind of like unofficially signed uh, mm. photographers, which is kind of cool. So I learned about that, and that's kind of what I am right now. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like playing in Italy professional basketball, and then kind of like waiting to get to the NBA, kind of. Right. Or minor league baseball, any other sport metaphor that you can think of. Yeah. Yes. But I've known recently. Nice. So I have a question I ask every sure. photographer who's on this, and I'm going to split it into two for you because you've done two genres fa fairly successfully, music and now lifestyle. Uh, for the first part, what is one piece of advice you could give to beginning concert photographers, and then what's one piece of advice you'd give to beginning lifestyle photographers? To the concert photographers... See, I don't know, because I just don't like them anymore. I, I really... <laughs> it sounds so bad. Like, the people seeing this would probably think I'm a pompous asshole, which I, I understand. It's just that I don't... Concert photography... Because no one gave me advice, honestly. Sure. This is, this is a big thing in photography now, where everybody's just asking everybody, how do I do something? You know, I don't know how to do this. Go fucking learn it. Yeah. Um, you'll probably bleep it out. Whatever. Go learn it. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. When, when I first started, I didn't have, you know, the certain websites that people go to now, whether it's looking up lighting or, you know, certain people doing gear reviews or whatever. That didn't really exist, mm -hmm. except I think maybe Ken Rockwell was the only person out, but that was, I mean, the guy's just not doing videos. He's just kind of listing the specs on a camera and saying, this camera's great. Yeah. But, um, yeah, just, just go out and learn. It's easy now if you have a digital camera, you just go out. Mess with the little settings. If you don't know what anything is, just try it. You can yeah. go on the internet, and the internet's a thing now, right? Yeah. You can basically find anything about anything. <laughs> and concert photography is easy. High, IS, high ISO, uh, decent aperture, and decent shutter speed, and you're good to go. I mean, really, there's mm -hmm. really no, there's no, there's nothing. You have to find a way to kind of put life into concert photographs, you know what I mean? It, it's very hard to explain, just cause, because like I said, the band is doing everything, and you're just there to make sure you capture certain moments if you can, mm -hmm. and that's about it. What I would say to concert photographers is to get out of the photo pit, because mm -hmm. that's what I started to do a lot. I started to get out of the photo pit or move away from the other photographers and kind of you know, shoot from the crowd. Uh, shoot from balconies or something like that. You know, it, it, that's more of the lifestyle photographer in me, I guess. But you know, uh, here's here's one piece of advice that I'll give to concert photographers that they can okay. take away and say, okay, I won't do this. Don't shoot up. That's it. They're on a stage. They're higher than you. If you're shooting straight up at a subject, you're shooting up his nose. You're not getting his face. And I cannot tell you how many photographs that I see mm -hmm. of. You know, guitarists and you know vocalists getting shot up the nose, and it, they're not good photographs. Mm -hmm. That'll be the photography for professor in me saying, "Don't do that. It doesn't look good." <laughs> but sorry, you know. Um, yeah, get out of the photo pit. That's a good way. That's a good way to, mm -hmm. I think, to, to kind of immerse yourself in it more. Yeah, yeah. And, and for lifestyle photographers, one. So. Well, lifestyle photography is just getting out there and shooting for the most part. You got to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, but another big part is being inspired. So I would just try to, you know, just spend your time on either Tumblr, just following every photographer that's listed in that little directory when you're searching for blogs to follow. Just follow everybody. Um, follow fashion blogs, uh, follow newspapers and stuff like that because. Mm -hmm. I have a uh, I have an inspiration Tumblr, just like a regular Tumblr that's not attached to my photographies. It's just photography, it's just photos that I like mm -hmm. that I'll reblog and put on this blog, and I'll see a photo and I'll say that looks interesting. Why don't we do a story about uh, uh, white button down shirts on on women or something like that, or you know, let's do a story with women with short hair and androgynous clothing or something like that. Like just 
any idea you have is a great idea to actually go out and shoot it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, find models in your area, use your friends, whatever, and, you know, go to a thrift store and buy a lot of cheap clothes and style them that way. You know, it doesn't have to be Prada and Versace at first, I guess. So, um, it's just made, it's just making a lot of friends, making a lot of connections, and then uh, just finding inspiration. Not necessarily copying it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but that's it, really. All right. I'm not the best person to ask for advice because, like <laughs> I said, I'm kind of mean when it comes to giving advice to photographers just because I don't want to give all the secrets away. Oh, of course. But, um, of course. but I, do, I feel here. Can I say one, one thing, too? Anything uh, you want. Sure. For photographers out there, especially younger ones that are thinking about going to school for photography, don't. There's no reason to pay thousands of dollars in tuition to go learn from professors who don't shoot anymore, mm -hmm. who are just basically going to judge the shit out of your work. It doesn't make any sense to do that. You put yourself through too much stress. College kids throw themselves off the buildings. It's stupid. Move to New York or L.A., <laughs> find a really, really cheap apartment. Mm -hmm. And your parents, instead of paying you know fifteen thousand dollars a year, twenty thousand dollars a year, they'll pay six hundred dollars a month, which will turn out to be four thousand dollars a year. Maybe I don't know. I'm just picking that number out of my head. I don't know the math on that. Well, let's see. No, it'll be about six to eight thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Get a part-time job, and then shoot. Mm. That and that's that will be your photo college, honestly. You know, and mm -hmm. I. I, that, I, that's what I tell people, and you know, I just don't agree with going to college for art. Hmm. Doesn't yeah. make any sense because you know, if you do move to New York or LA, you can find uh, a lot of these collective, uh, where they, uh, collective creative spaces where you can sort of work and hang out around people who are doing the same thing you're trying to do. Mm -hmm make friends that way. You can intern for photographers. You can go find a job at a studio. When I came off tour with Justin, I wasn't doing anything, like you said. So I got a job as uh, what I do. I worked in the uh, the front of a studio. Mm -hmm. So I would greet the people coming in. I would clean up the studios. I would make sure that all the studios had the proper lights and equipment that were on a call sheet or whatever. Then I would clean up the studio. I would paint the psych wall. I would do everything. And it has advantages. I could shoot in that studio whenever I wanted. So instead of spending money on school, it just wouldn't make sense. Just move to the city that is, are essentially hubs for photography or film or anything, L.A., New York, and do that. You save money, you meet people, and who knows? Two years in New York, if, you, if you've survived it, you can pretty much do anything anywhere. All right. Well, yeah. so. thanks so much for doing this. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, this has been great. Uh, Thanks for watching. This has been the second episode of ISO 400. There were some questions last week about whether or not this is actually a podcast. It will be. We're still working on the nuts and bolts of getting this onto iTunes. So for now, we're just releasing this on YouTube. And we'll be sure to let you know when it's available fully as a podcast. So thanks for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next week.